Civilizations and cultures all around the world, from both the present and the long-distant past, would be familiar with the concept in the spiritual belief systems of a pantheon of negatively tainted gods and their minions who were led by an ultimate diabolical entity. These beings, according to various traditions and customs, were inscribed on stone over the centuries. In fact, they still are right up into the present digital format. In this short documentary, I wish to explore a number of these beings who have become amalgamated to form one. In the West, this apparently formidable entity has caused us to do unspeakable things to each other and has the uncanny ability to target and exploit our weaknesses and tempt us with the promise of forbidden fruit. However, who or what is truly behind that mask? Who is it that walks the dark halls of our hearts? Could he be known today as Satan? To understand this being, we must pass through the wall of history that formed the basis of Christianity. Judaism actually says very little on the subject of a superior evil entity in the present day, but they did at one time. Christianity, however, goes hell for leather and references this ultimate adversary every chance it gets. By the medieval period, Satan had gone from being a quiet adversary of God, who was in the background and often challenged God's decisions, before evolving into becoming God's nemesis a being that raised hell in order to win our souls in a tug-of-war with the Almighty himself. By the early to middle medieval period, Satan had formed into what we know today, due in part to a mixture of influences, which include the stories of old Greek demons and the Arcadian shepherd god Pan, and thrown into the mixing pot were the absolute vivid imaginations of the scribes. One of the founding cornerstones leading to the rebirth of this new adversary was, of course, Pazuzu. The Mesopotamian solution to dealing with these pesky troublemakers was to ward them off with an effigy of an even bigger and meaner evil entity. This never-ending ladder of authority must have been mind-boggling. Pazuzu was known as a demon of the southwestern wind, and depictions of him show large fine teeth, bulging eyes and bird feet, and unluckily for him, he was also associated with disease, corruption and disaster, although he wasn't the worst of the demons. Throughout this region of the world, there were other infernal night dwellers that caused all manner of menace. For instance, Lemus II. This evil goddess was worshipped in Assyria as a lion-headed queen of the underworld. The ball really started rolling with Satan when Ezekiel created the archangels, which in themselves were nothing more than planetary gods of Babylon. By 586 BC, the captured Israelites, used by King Nebuchadnezzar, needed a workforce to repair the great Babylonian empire. It was here that Ezekiel, in an attempt to form monotheism, downgraded the Babylonian planetary gods to archangels and made them servants of their god. During this time, the scribes were granted access to the great Babylonian libraries, sourcing stories of ancestral record, which included the Great Flood, Adam and Eve, the Great Tower of Babel, which all made it into the book of Genesis once the spin doctors had finished with them. One unholy character, however, was mentioned in Hebrew texts, which were found in the cave system in the 1940s. The horde became known as the Dead Sea Scrolls. In it, they mention a leader of supreme evil called Mastima. This being was so callous, they must have shook at his very mention, though it seems he wasn't important enough to be added to the works of modern religious teachings. Mastima was hidden away in a cave, only to be found centuries later. I wonder, was it an embarrassing factor in that Mastima, in all his wicked ways, had been granted permission by God to carry out his temptations of man? 
We find clues of this throughout the ancient texts, that these evil beings were never equal to God but below him. And a point of fact is that God allowed it to happen. I make peace and create evil. Book of Isaiah 45, 7. Satan's place in the Old Testament was similar to the arrangement in the House of Commons in England, where the ruling seat of the United Kingdom, where the leader stands and delivers his ideas and plans for the country, but then would have to stand aside to let the House opposition have some of those ideas dissected and broken apart by the lesser leader of the opposing party, who in this case would be Satan, which in Old Hebrew meant accuser. There was nothing in the Old Testament which sold Satan as being the horned devil we see today. This idea of Satan being God's equal may have its roots in the ancient Sumerian texts, which describes the politics and struggles between two city gods, namely Enlil, a decreer of fates, and God associated with the skies, and Enki, a god of wisdom who was associated with water. Enki, by the behest of Enlil, created man, but man became too great and made too much noise, and Enlil brought a flood down on man, so he could have his silence back. However, Enki knew the diabolical plans and gave man wisdom, and man survived the flood, and Enki was punished. This creation story is very similar to the book of Genesis that came thousands of years later, which, as stated, also included the story of the Great Flood. Zoroastrianism is another form of worship that developed in pre-Islamic Iran around 600 BC and possibly had an influence in Gnosticism, Buddhism and Christianity, amongst others. It believed in a dualistic form of cosmology which believed in an equal amount of good and evil, but promoted the idea of the good fight, which we hear about in modern-day Christianity, the never-ending battle between good and evil. These are but some of the influences which have led to the birth of this ultimate being of shock and awe. Yet the being of the Old Testament is by far so foreign to the New Testament, it's amazing they actually made the huge leap and melded the two together. The Christian scribes must have had many long nights and years of meditation to form the links. The New Testament was compiled around 360 AD, whereas the Old Testament was only compiled centuries after the New Testament. However, by using the aspects from the later Latin transcribed Hebrew Bible called the Vulgate, we are able to find the missing pieces to form a greater myth. For instance, if we consider in the Vulgate, Isaiah 14, in which it refers to Lucifer as meaning a bearer of light, an earthly king who fell from grace, not someone from outside the realm of this world, but very much part of it. But in the New Testament, Luke 10 verses 18, Jesus is alleged to have said, I saw Satan fall from heaven like a flash of lightning. By the 5th century, both of these beings were firmly welded together. I should point out at this stage that there has been a word continuously applied to the modern cohorts of Satan as devils. Even Satan himself has been called a devil. However, this terminology is not quite right, and the devils are indeed in the details. The term originates from the Old English default, which means nuisance. Its later association is embroiled with the Greek diablos, which refers to someone who creates slurs or alleges negative claims against someone. Demons, on the other hand, have just as long a lineage as you can read in Deuteronomy 32 verse 17. Moses speaks about the fact that there are places in lonely areas which are held for the Shadim. These, for the most part, are invisible beings, but can be tracked through history from the Near East right into the modern world. 
from the use of the word genius, which in Roman terms referred not to wisdom from within, but the whispers of something from outside the body. In other words, if you were good at the arts and did well, they would say you listened to your genius. Today, it would be associated with the whispers from a guardian angel. Same phenomena, different mask. The Roman genius is taken from a different perspective of the same phenomena and is derived from genii. Genii is derived from the Islamic jinn, jinn from shirim, and shirim from shirim, a type of hairy demon. Early Greek customs believe in two distinct types of demon, the hairy pan-type version and the other, those that spoke the law. It was this type that dictated rules to which rulers and kings were instructed to maintain us and keep us in line. Meeting in particular areas of natural power, our leaders would have visited these places of oracle. Offerings would be made and communications would have been established. These demigods are where our attention should truly be fixed, as the ideas of Satan and God are no more than artificial constructs. The true power is possessed by these subversive shadows that find their way into all walks of life and that did and still do interfere in human affairs. By keeping us fixated on the constructs which changed like our modern political leaders do, Behind the scenes was another branch that worked very hard at keeping their slimy tracks covered, and more worryingly, still do. Chapter 9 